In this video, Professors Asasian and Kaufman will explain the methodology they developed together over the years for team teaching the conflict. While the focus is on the protracted Israeli-Palestinian cycles of war and peace, the methods may be used in other identity-driven disputes. The points mentioned in this video are only part of the 15 guidelines that can be used for team teaching a conflict. And if you're interested in getting the full picture, you can join them this coming summer session too, or contact Professor Kaufman. We also see the professors answering some questions brought up in the previous class. What are the rules of engagement, as we call it, in the process of team teaching a conflict? Well, we took some uh, advice. I took some advice of the, is there something called the Center for Teaching Excellency at the University of Maryland. And we wanted to know uh, what do they know about team teaching? Because, I mean, team teaching, you know, is an interesting idea for any subject, biology, anthropology. There are two different disciplines that you can bring together on an issue. So we got, I personally got quite a lot of uh, ideas. But the idea of team teaching a conflict, we have nobody, nobody could tell us how you do that. So it's by trial and error over the years, we came up with this uh, list of, by now we keep adding, now we have about uh, perhaps 15 uh, different points, or maybe. I'm not going to cover them all. They are in the article with Professor Assassin that you have already in the blackboard, most of them. I just want you to understand, and in the exam, we're not going to ask a question about the Russians of the course, don't you worry, but just so that we are on the same page, and so you understand what brought us to the idea of teaching together, and then how did we find the common ground? Okay, the first thing is, uh, we don't, don't get locked into a conventional zero-sum and deterministic interpretations of our conflict. I just say, now we are not moving from, from uh, we are not keeping the same style all through the course. We are starting adversarial and we are assuming that there will be a peace process. And there will, we, we know, if not now, next year or something, and then there will be negotiations. So we want to move into the future where people have to decide how to accommodate the antagonistic position. So, we are not into scoring, uh, you know, saying, I, okay, my, my truth is better than your truth. So I give an example about, uh, about the right to come and settle in the land. The Jews have been asking for a right to settle in the land after 2,000 years. The Palestinians, who are many of them refugees, are asking to go back and settle in their land, they call it their land, after 62 years. Are we going to make a big uh, fight about who has more rights? 2,000 years, is it more than 62 or is it less? Even if we check uh, international law, there is nothing there that tells you 62 is less or more than 2,000. So we are not into that. So what we are trying to do is to, anything that is a conventional zero sum, we try to challenge it. We sort of, uh, many conflicts, of this kind that are prolonged and with a lot of suffering and a lot of victims and a lot of civilian kills, many of the issues in the conflict are not property right, property or water. They are very what we call non-tangible issues, like pride, humiliation, acknowledgement, apology, forgiveness, dignity. You, that's not zero sum. Of course, you cannot even measure that. And we can give a lot of that for free if the other side will also give something for free. So we sort of reject this uh, very simplistic way of saying conflict, you know, if I gain something, you lose something, and that's always been like that, you know, kind of, if you want to call it the realist approach of international relations versus the liberal approach of international relations, we are more on the side of the liberal approach, and not on the realist approach. If we will start only 120 years ago, 30 years ago, I mean, the what we call the Zionists, and I will explain the term, the idea of coming back to Zion became a, a, a movement in 1870. Before 1870, there were very few Jews in the land of Israel, very few, maybe 4,000 Jews. 1870 started a wave after wave of immigrants that were idealistic. They did not go there because there was a gold mine Many of those who wanted the gold mine, maybe they went to the U.S. They escaped, of course, from Europe, 
to other places, but Palestine was, you know, poor, I mean, uh, desertic, I mean, there was nothing attractive there, except the idea to rebuild a Jewish sovereignty there. So these people, uh, we can start the history there, the Palestinian history also around that time. How did they confront the, what they would call the Jewish colonizers, like South Africa, like Australia, with the aborigines? I mean, there are different perceptions of the wishes of the two sides. So we could, but then it would be the history of the conflict. But if I go with my periodization, what uh, at the time, uh, you know, from Muhammad onwards, and we see how many centuries did the Jews live in good relations with the Arabs, and how many centuries did they fight, we will see that the balance is positive. And in some years, especially in Spain, it was a love affair. They were, you know, very much together, Islam and Judaism, doing a lot of discoveries and technology at that time. Everything was very much Muslim Jewish at that time in Spain. So here is a choice, you know, and we are not historians, and we cannot uh, start teaching, you know, all. So what we say is please read this only article about the history of Jews and Arabs, because we have made a choice to deal mostly with the present, right? But we have to give you the background, which is the clash started 130 years ago, the clash. But we know, if you tell me it means that the next 130 years will be years of war and clash, is that what I'm saying? No. If I look 13 centuries back, it's more good news than bad news. But if I look only 130 years, because that's what I know as a political scientist, uh, that would be more conflict than peace. I, I admit that you know we were more in conflict than peace. So we are looking at the history as something that can be interpreted differently. You know, the question of periodization, we say, is a matter of choice. Because I could well teach with an historian. You see, and then we go back, I mean, we can have a two semester or three semester course, we could do that. But we opted, you know, to have two political scientists dealing, you know, with the present uh, conflict resolution issues and so on. So this is important to remember, that we have made a choice, but we want the students to remember that Jews in Arab countries were much more protected than Jews, Jews in Europe over these 13th centuries. That the most horrible things for the Jews happened in Europe. The Inquisition in Spain, when they expelled the Muslims and the Jews, the Catholics, and in fact they forced Jews to convert or to burn in fire, those who stayed, I mean, horrible. And then there were all kinds of anti-Semitic things that happened, you know, from the Tsar and in France and all kinds of things, let alone Hitler, who was in Europe, the most enlightened country of Europe, Germany. Well, the Jews perhaps were not treated totally as equals in the, as as non-Muslims, they were uh, the people of the book, but they were not Muslims in the Arab world, but they were protected, and they were not persecuted, and they had a reasonable way of life in most Arab countries. So we don't want you not to know that, even if we're going to be talking about the last period. It's very important. And uh, it's because, you know, because you say the past predicts the future. I beg to differ for one thing, but if we look at the past, and we only tell you read you know, Abish line, which is the conflict, that would be wrong, because you can look at it, you know, much more deeper and say, what happened for the first time that an Arab met a Jew until, until we are present? How many years Arabs and Jews were fighting? And how many years were living alone? And how many years were they incorporating? I mean, centuries, a couple of centuries in, in Spain. So that's important, you know, and we are making that Perhaps the only one I never, you know, that's our own uh, development of our thinking, and I think it's important for anybody who teaches the Middle East conflict, as people used to call it, the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Now, I always say this, and I hope one day, even if I die, people will remember what I used to say. I say there is no way that we cannot solve this problem except by negotiations, and there will never be a military solution to this conflict. And if Israel is going basically to be part and parcel of the Middle East, we don't want Israel to be in the Middle East, we want Israel to be part of the Middle East. And to be part of the Middle East, they have to understand that they have to give up territory. They cannot have peace and territory at the same time. So this is given. 
these are facts on the ground, nobody can change them. Now, from one government to another, there has been certain kind of different policies and tactics. I must say, and as my ex-president used to say, God rest his soul, we had a potential partner who almost delivered peace, but was assassinated as a result, and that was Prime Minister Rabin. Unfortunately, in the Israeli leadership, we don't have Rabins. We have Mahmoud Abbas, regardless of the ineffectiveness of my president, because he is fought by Arab radicals, by Islamic fundamentalists, because he believes in pragmatism, he is paying a very heavy price. And that heavy price that he's paying today is because of his moderate positions. Uh, the first question, what efforts are being made, if any, to stimulate positive relations between Palestinian and the Israeli civilians on a personal level? Or are these efforts expected to be included in the creation of peace following successful negotiations? I mean, you know, uh, there are different schools of thought in this. One school of thought, basically, is that in order to have longevity of peace, we have to build certain kind of relationship between the two civil societies. And we cannot really build a relationship between two civil societies if we don't change our perceptions, our culture of what culture of peace is all about, and if we don't change our education, our curricula in accepting the other. So the question of peaceful coexistence is not to negate the other, but to accept the other. So, so the politics of inclusion is, is very important here to pave the way uh, for uh, uh, the longevity of peace. And I think, you know, people think, one school of thought thinks, that the negotiations ultimately will bring people together if there is a peace. Another school of thought says, why should we wait for politicians to make peace? Why can't we build the bridges between our communities and that will put pressure on our leadership to reconcile and, uh, and to sign uh, a final peace uh, treaty. So these two schools of thought we have been uh, dealing with, you know, uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think we tried both of them in one way or another, but the shortcomings were, were uh, in both cases, you know, were detrimental as uh, to the exacerbation of conflict rather than creating a certain kind of communality of uh, accepting each other. Uh, I believe that societies actually, uh, in our case, our conflict has been shaped by two important factors, I must say. One is the factor of mutual hate and distrust, and the second factor is the mutual of fear. So these two concepts, I must say, have shaped our protracted conflict. And as a result, the psychological aspect of this conflict plays a significant role in epistemic communities when they are in conflict with each other. And therefore, I think the question of making peace should not be put on equal footing with signing a peace treaty. Signing a peace between governments could be easy after a long conflict, but making peace between people takes a long time because you have to build the trust 